Well, welcome back to part two of Introduction to Orbital Mechanics. And once again, thank you to the folks from AGI and PLTW for providing this material. So at the end of part one, we were looking at inclinations. So let's just stop for a second and do a, a little aside. So there's something called a ground trace, and you've probably seen these before. And here on our map, we have uh, a little satellite that's just over South America. Now, if we play the video, it's going to show us what this, what a ground trace is. And I always like to think of a ground trace as if you were to have the satellite, have a big spotlight shining straight down on Earth, directly underneath where it is. And if you were to uh, have that flashlight draw a line or here it talks about tying a magic marker with a string which is probably a better example what would that look like here's what it would look like in this case might not be what you would expect you might expect it to go over the same path but what happens is because the earth rotates you see the the line shift west. So it started here over South America, and when it came to the same place, so we go straight west over the equator, um, it actually move, it appears like it's moving west. So we'll talk about some good information that you can get from that. Well, here's what it would look like after a full day. Um, this satellite has uh, apparently about a 90 minute orbital period, and we'll just play this video real quick to show you what it looks like. If you were to draw the ground traces for a whole day, this is what it would look like. It kind of looks like a weave. Um, and you can notice here that this satellite goes from roughly 45 degrees above the Earth, above the equator, sorry, to minus 45 degrees or 45 degrees below the equator. So anywhere in between there, the satellite can observe what's going on underneath it. So a question might be, is this, would this be a good orbit for observing something going on in Alaska? For example, if there was a, an oil spill up here, could you use this satellite to observe that? The answer is no, because it doesn't get up that high. So now let's get back and kind of tie some of these things together, back to inclination. So the inclination of a satellite in degrees is really equal to the northern and southern limits uh, in a ground trace. Um, so we can see the inclination uh, here in the upper left picture. Those ground traces are denoted below. So notice that the the five degree inclination, which we saw before, is denoted by this narrower band here. And then on the extreme, we have the, the orange inclination, which I think was 75. And you can 75 degrees. So you can see what that ground trace looks like. So you can tell a lot by looking at the ground trace. Um, it, you can determine what the inclination is. So here's a question for you. Which one of these might be uh, suitable for a weather satellite. I would say the orange one, because you would want to see the weather over most of the Earth. And if I were to pick one of these that covers most of the Earth, that would be the higher inclination orbit. So let's just take a look at some special cases, uh, some special terms. So uh, an inclination of zero is just called an equatorial orbit. You can see that up here on the top. Um, and 90 degrees is called a polar orbit. Yeah, pretty wild and pretty crazy, kind of almost what you would expect, right? Well, what do those ground traces look like? So from the previous slide, we had the top uh, as an equatorial orbit, and its ground trace is really just a straight line that traces the equator. The polar orbit, however, looks kind of funky. It looks like a, a really weird sine wave. Um, and the reason it does that is because, again, the Earth rotates. So you might expect it to be just a vertical line, but it's not. It is canted a little bit, and that's strictly due to the Earth's rotation.
Ground traces can tell us uh, not only the inclination, but we can also get the period from it, the orbital period. So they're pretty, uh, pretty interesting things, some good information that we can get. So how do we get the period? So let's take a look. There's a step-by-step -step approach. So remember that uh, satellite remains fixed in space. Uh, I should say its orbital plane does with respect to the Earth, but that the Earth rotates. So that's why it moves from uh, east to west. And one thing to know that we need to know, and we kind of know from science, is how long it takes for Earth to rotate. It goes 360 degrees in one day. One day is 1440 minutes, so we can determine that each degree of rotation takes four minutes. So now let's say that we have a ground trace that shows here uh, 25 degrees. So in other words with each pass the ground trace moves west 25 degrees. From that we just do some simple math to find out what the period is. So we take 25 degrees and we use our conversion factor of four minutes per degree and we get 100 minutes. Pretty cool. But we're not done uh, completing our... We, we, we don't understand enough yet about some of the orbital parameters. We haven't defined everything. So one thing to take a look at here is we have a different view uh, of our globe. The blue line, uh, the vertical blue line, is the Greenwich Meridian, or uh, the meridian, the longitude line of zero degrees that goes through Greenwich, England. Uh, where time was essentially invented. So all the orbits here um, have the same eccentricities, they have the same inclination, and same semi-major axis. So each satellite starts above uh, a different longitude on the Earth, as you can see here. Uh, and again, our equatorial plane is the mesh. So let's take a look and see what happens. So you can see for yourself, they all have the same period. The same, their plane doesn't move, but the Earth does rotate beneath them. So we need some way to reference where these orbits cross the equatorial plane. And that's called right ascension of the ascending node, uh, RAN, or capital Omega, the little horseshoe. So by definition, the right ascension of the ascending node is measured along the, the equator, the equatorial plane. And ascending here is a, the, an important word. So it's measured as the satellite is coming up or it's ascending from south to north where it crosses that equatorial plane. So that's a little point that we want to reference. The red line here references the vernal equinox. So recall from science that the vernal equinox is the first day of spring. So this red line is our reference point. So you can see here satellite 2, for example this orange or yellow, whatever color you want to call that, right where that satellite crosses the equatorial plane, if you have draw an angle along that plane over to the uh, vernal equinox, that's 30 degrees. So that's how we um, that's how we distinguish these orbits. Remember that are the same in every other respect. As you can see, once again, the equatorial, the uh, orbital planes don't change. So this is really our fixed point in space, our uh, vernal equinox. So this is the coordinate system uh, that we use, and it's important to note that, that that position, the red arrow, changes also. It's not constant. Uh, so there, for example, there's two different coordinate systems, uh, one that was set in 1950, uh, and then the one that we most recently use called J2000, which was where that point was set in the year 2000. 
Finally, the last uh, the last component we need to look at is something called the argument of perigee. I take that back. There's one more after this. The argument of perigee is a little omega. So these four orbits have the same uh, e, a inclination and ran yet they're different so we want to know okay if everything else is equal where is perigee and where's apogee so you can see here uh, that all these orbits and let it run have the same period but where their perigee is is totally different so that's called the argument of perigee so you can see that for red, it's zero degrees, uh, and that's measured uh, as from the ascending node to the perigee point. That's the angle for the argument of perigee. Finally, the last one. This is truly the last one. <clears throat> it's called True Anomaly. And so I play this video. It's probably uh, easier to understand it. So you see the perigee here is denoted by this horizontal line. And as the satellite travels around, True Anomaly, now that we want it, we know everything else, True Anomaly is the point on that orbit where the satellite is at any given time. So if it's travel and it's in the direction of motion as measured from perigee. So perigee is right here and so we would measure it in the counterclockwise direction. So let's review what we've learned in parts one and two. So there are two things that describe the size and shape of the orbit. So there's eccentricity and the semi-major axis, E and A. Then we need to figure out what the orientation of that shape is. And so remember we looked at inclination, right ascension of the ascending node, argument of perigee, and remember those are both angles. And then finally, where is that satellite on that ellipse? Is it at perigee? Uh, where is it with respect to perigee? And that's called true anomaly. There's one more thing. It's not a, a measurement or an angle, but it's really a time stamp. Um, and engineers and scientists call that an epoch. Um, you will learn if you go take orbital mechanics in college, um, that's a reference date that goes back uh, quite a ways. It's kind of a complex number, uh, but the term Julian date is what you will use. We won't use that in this course, but that's just a little extra. And finally, let's go back to, we've talked a little bit about Kepler's laws and how he was a pretty smart guy in the 1600s. Um, and a lot of his laws um, we still use today because they, they are laws, they're fixed. So he first figured out the first law that um, all orbits, closed orbits, are ellipses. Um, and the second one is a little bit uh, a little bit more complex, so it requires uh, a diagram, and what it says is that uh, satellites will sweep out equal times, or equal areas in equal times. So let's take a look at this diagram. So we have a satellite going here, um, near perigee, and both of the times here, both of the uh, angles subtended by the orbit um, are the same time. So you can see how it goes faster at perigee. So if this were a circle, that would kind of make sense. If this were a circular orbit, it would go faster than it would if it were a circular orbit out here. So it goes faster while it's at perigee, slower while it's at apogee. So if you look at the green area here, the green area on the right is the same as the green area on the left. Pretty amazing that he figured that out. And really all that means is that um, it goes faster when it's closer to perigee than it does at apogee. And then finally his third law we've already kind of hinted at when we looked at the time period, uh, which totally relates to only the uh, 
semi-major axis. And so what he figured out, the equation he wrote, was the square of the time is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. And that's how we can figure out the period. Or if we know the period, we can figure out what the semi-major axis is. And again, you won't take the assessment. If you are watching this as part of an Ed puzzle, you will have already done so.